Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome to the Khalid Podcast. I'm Kairo Soli and this is episode 21. My guest today is Hazik Rashid, the social entrepreneur. You are the co-founder of the project Nomad, a social enterprise that provides greater opportunities for rural artisans in Asia. These artisans produce high quality leather and wooden crafts where each purchase is also used to support a local school that provides education for underprivileged children. You guys gain recognition through awards such as National Champions for Enactors in 2016 and the Singapore International Foundation Young Social Entrepreneur Award. We are here to talk about your journey building the Project Nomad, being a social enterprise, experience in backpacking and more. Hazik. Assalamualaikum. Hello. Welcome to the Khalid Podcast. Thanks for having me here. A pleasure, brother. It's a pleasure. Right, so how have you been, man? Uh, we are out of the isolation period, going into the new normal. How have you been adapting? I heard you're in Malaysia right now. So how's things going? Yeah, man, like uh, it's, it's awesome, man. Like just, just being here, I'm enjoying all the food, even when, it, <laughs> even when I'm in isolation. Just get food every day, man. Uh, right. But yeah, generally, like um, I enjoy it. I think uh, that whole, we call it movement control order here, CB in Singapore. Uh, it's, it's a great time for contemplation, uh, for you to reflect, for you to slow down a little bit. Uh, be it in your own life or be it in terms of uh, your businesses, right? So for myself, like I've picked up a lot of things that mm. that I wanted to pick up but I have never had the time to. And one of it was realizing my retirement dream of being a farmer. <laughs> so oh, okay, wow. yeah. So so I planted uh like chili plants, okra, eggplant. Nice. Uh, yeah, uh, cool stuff. Man. Like, I I didn't know like you you need you need to do a lot because. Because you know, like um, house flies, they yeah. will like lay eggs on your leaf. That's when you like get like a lot of spotted white dots uh-huh, there. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, right, and right, it starts right. like eating your plant up from inside. So yeah, all, all these small little details that like, it excites yeah. me. Uh, <laughs> I I end up brewing coffee. I don't know, sorry, really? Like, I, yeah, so yeah. So all, like, all in in the the backyard. Uh, coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so wow. like. I was just experimenting like a few types of coffee brewing, but but you know these are all like just side passion. Mm, mm. So how's business affected uh, for you and yeah during this, this period? Uh, I think it's definitely an interesting time. Like for for mm-hmm. me, um, it's not really greatly affected per se, right? right uh, and and I think when I read about the whole lockdown happening, there's generally like a transition happening uh, because in places such as Malaysia. Or it could even be in Singapore, right? Uh, not everyone is accustomed to shopping online, right? So there's a large majority of the population that still transacts offline. Yep. So, so the thing is that while, while it is kasian, like for, for all these businesses that, that you know, um, do not have the capacity to, to reach out to their customer because physical shop is not there, the potential is moving on to an online presence. The reason being is because... Um, a segment of the population that is used to purchasing offline, now they are forced to convert to online or rather they start to learn on how to move towards an online space. And this is an un, uh, irreversible attitude because once they start to do that, even after like MCO is over, the new normal for them is to purchase online as well. Because mm. certain things that you get online is definitely going to be cheaper than offline. Um, as well as Correct. you can get the space, a lot of varieties online at your convenience compared to offline. So for me personally, um, it's great. It's, it's great. In fact, I could see that uh, my sales starts to go up. Nice. Yeah, because I, 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 I do e-commerce as well. Right, right. Alhamdulillah, yeah. alhamdulillah. Yeah, I think it forces people to, you know, to go, to jump on board digitally. So I think it's, it's good also. That's the, the, the plus side, right? Yeah. Yeah. Of, of all of the things happening. Okay, let's talk about you, you know, your background. Uh, you know, I, uh, before the Project Nomad started, I know you are into sales and marketing. You, you right. were working for Tom's. Maybe you can share a bit uh, of your journey before, before Project Nomad. Right. Uh, so, so my journey before Project Nomad, how far do we take this though? Uh, like how, how, how far before? Like, I think my life changed during NS, shortly after NS, the, the steps that I take after NS. Sure. 
okay, but did you, you have a question later about how I started Project Nomad or? Of course, of course. Oh, then I should keep it to there, man. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, Let, let's do that. Okay, right, I'll sure. just roughly talk about my, my, my experience. So, um, there was one point of time, like I, I, I will share a bit about this experience later on. But I started off working in uh, the sales and marketing company. It's an outsourced sales and marketing company. It's a job that nobody would ever want to pick up. <laughs> as, a young, Tell as, me about as, it. As, as a young guy, right? Because back then, uh, I just finished army. Um, and then I left university. I was only in for two weeks. I hated it. I left. So I was like, what was I going to do in life? I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, short, cut, cut, cut the story short. Somehow I was in an outsourced sales and marketing agency. Um, and I didn't know it was what it was. So right. what I was doing is I was knocking on doors, <laughs> selling Domino's coupon. Could you imagine that? Um, and being, oh. being, being at that age, right? Like there's a certain form of like self-awareness, that feeling of like paisiness, you know, like what if I knock on door? Like it's my friend. That, yeah. That, oh uh, my God. Yes. Yes. Know? Or what if it's like your... I don't know, man, like your high school crush or something that answers it. Like, yeah, that's it. That's gla- it. <laughs> yeah, that glamorous, bro. Like, you, you get what I'm saying? Uh, but I will say that jo- that job changed my entire life mm-hmm. uh, because it teaches me the fundamentals of running a business and that is essentially sales. Every company yeah. needs sales. Uh, and in order for you to think from a very macro viewpoint on how to manage things, right? You need to zoom down to one of the more important components of the business and that is sales. So literally, uh, my job every day is knocking on doors, selling pizza coupon. A day, I knock for like 400 to 500 doors. So wow. if you do that every day for like a period of a year, right? You talk to so many different kind of people. In a matter of like just 5 to 10 seconds, I could tell that, you know, is this person going to buy from me or not? Right. right? right. Um, and in a matter of like a few seconds, so, so it trains your mind to be, to be, I don't know, I wouldn't say debate, but it's like a chess piece, right? Yeah. Customer says, A, you move the chess piece here, this is what you're going to say. Customers buy one, you're going to upsell the customer, you know, there's more value there, you know? So, yeah. and, and, and eventually, right, like I, I become so fixed upon this, like, I was so enthusiastic about it, I started reading more and more, uh, I was only like, I think 20, 21, so, so from, from, from doing that, uh, I became one of the top salesperson in that company. Uh, and then I started to manage teams and lead teams. And then I started designing campaigns. So I moved nice. from just being that um, salesman-ish guy. I started to like uh, design campaigns. Like, 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 you know, if our client is uh, a telco company, how could we use our outsource um, sales and marketing team to improve their sales? Right? So, so there's a lot of fun there. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so that's for that. Uh, but the skills that I get from there uh, allowed me to go to US after that. So I, 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 was doing, I, I was doing well there. And I thought that, man, like this is my calling in life. I, 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 I love knocking on doors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was, how old were you? Uh, sorry, uh, let me think, 17, 18. So I guess it was like 19 or 20, I was doing that. Um, to, and, and I could make like between two to three grand a week wow. uh, selling, selling that. Yeah. So, so, so as a young, as, as a young boy back then, I was like, damn man, like this is so fun. Like yeah, you don't really have much in, commit. You, yeah. you don't really have much, uh, thought on, on the grander scheme in life. You know, and I was like, okay, this, this is my calling, man. Like screw the degree. <laughs> I'm passionate about selling my pizza coupon, about selling like, my, yeah. my you know, uh, telco, telco campaigns. But eventually later on, uh, Alhamdulillah, I think, I think uh, it's friends and I've, I've been involved in like a lot of social projects since I was young. Mm. So one of my friends approached me and said, that, hey bro, like, um, do you want to go to the United Nations Youth Assembly? So I said, mm. sure, man, like, why not? Um, so, so we applied and then we got selected. So, so we will become the Singapore Youth Delegate to, enter, to, to, to be at the United Nations. Wow. And, then, and then there was a social venture challenge for young aspiring entrepreneurs uh, to compete at the, at the UN. Mm. And, and just nice during that point of time, like uh, when we were about to fly there, like my friend had a really, really, really bad stomach problem. Like he was, he was hospitalized for it. 
So I had to fly to New York alone and pitch alone. Uh, it was a few days. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and we didn't fix, we haven't really properly fixed our business idea. There was nothing, almost nothing. Yeah. So, so I was there alone. I was like, damn, how do I go about doing this? You know, so it's like a one-man show. From the first day I was there, we had like, um, like credits from like uh, MIT, Oxford, all around us. Wow. Uh, and, and of course, you feel a little bit malu. Uh, back then, intimidated, yeah, yeah, a bit, a bit intimidated because when people look at you, people will be like, uh, "Yo, what school are you from, man?" <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, you, you couldn't really say anything. Uh, but Alhamdulillah, really, I think because of the knowledge that Cyrus, um, sorry, no, the, the the company I work with, it's called Cyrus Star. Um, it helped me to 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 really pitch very very well that I impressed the judges and it opened up doors of opportunity for me today. Right, mm. and then that's how I started the project Nomad, um, and eventually like uh, Tom's as well. Um, so, so I was the country manager of Tom's for a period of time. I was helping them to manage the sales and opening of like a few a few shops in Singapore. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it's all it all started with a passion for sales. How does it how does it suddenly like move to marketing or rather digital marketing, right? Um, it's because when you look at sales, you're, you're, I started off doing face-to-face sales, right? So at any point in time, the amount of um, sales you could close is based on the amount of interactions that you had, yep. right? But how do I scale it up even further? So when I started uh, Project Nomad uh, and moving into Tom's, you don't want to just focus on face-to-face interaction. You want to make sure that you are able to reach to the masses and that's when the similar enthusiasm for sales move into digital marketing. Mm. Uh, so I would say like a lot of the skill sets that I learned uh, primarily self-taught. Uh, oh, nice. And yeah, it's, 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 it's really, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of money is wasted as well there. But I would say that it's not money that is wasted because you learn from, from, from mistakes. The, the, the amount of money that you waste is so painful. They're like, damn, I'm not going to do this again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and of course, uh, there are certain places that, that I, I, I got the opportunity to learn from, uh, such as like learning directly from Facebook uh, on how to run their campaigns and stuff. Nice, nice. Wow, yeah. what a story. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, I heard a lot of uh, really successful entrepreneurs. They always started off with sales, you know, and hearing your story, right, I can really relate, uh, you know, you with them. And yeah, I think, I think I, I, I myself, I get jealous when I hear these kind of stories like, oh my God, I wish I wasted my teenage years knocking on doors, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> but I think, wow, that, what, what a foundation you had, you know, um, to, to, to now you see you, where you, where you at now. So nice, nice. Great job, man. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Let's talk. Let's dive into the project Nomad. Right. How, how did that happen and the journey? <laughs> oh, okay. It's, it's a crazy story. So, so again, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a millennial thing, man. Like, I don't know if like our, our parents think of it this way, but, but we're living in a time where there's so much influx of information happening, right? Everything's on the internet. There's so many possibilities of how your life could be. And at the same time, there's also like a certain level of privilege to be able to think that way. But I think generally in Singapore, having national service, right? It's an ample time for you to contemplate and reflect, right? So when I was in there, I was thinking like, what do I want to do? What do, do I want to be? Uh, I, was, I was from Tampa Junior College back then. Uh, and generally, generally like the, the societal expectation is that when you come from JC, you have to go to uni. Yep. Right? Um, and I chatted uh, with my parents about, it, about this as well. And they mentioned that, you know what? That's the only way it should be. You should go to university. Uh, because you, you went to JC, right? Yep, and I yep. said that I'm not really interested to do that because mm. number one, I don't know where my passion lies yet. I want to be able to explore that first. I believe uh, that I want to be enthusiastic about something and then some, uh, my, my efforts will go far, yep. right? Um, and I guess the interactions that I had with my friends when I was in UN or other projects overseas, they open up the possibility that, you know, it's okay for you to pause. It's okay to find out what you're really passionate in. Mm. And, and that became a form of inspiration for me, right? Uh, I had a friend in the States. Uh, she's, I, I met her in the States, sorry, but she's not from the States. She's from Africa, uh, right. Namibia, right? 
so she was telling me that uh, she she don't have any parents at all. She don't have any parents at all. Um, uh, they, they they met an accident, and then she is studying in another part of Africa, uh, and she's holding two jobs. In the day, uh, she's working in an office, um, mm-hmm. and by right, she's not allowed to work because she's not she's she's working in in another place, not in Africa, uh, another state in Africa. So the thing is that you need to have certain permit in order for you to work. She doesn't have yeah. that. Then she's like working illegally, yeah. right? Um, and at night she's working as a nanny. But at the same time, she became like the top law student in her school. Wow. Right? Um, and she said she took two years break to realize that that is a passion. Uh, and she became like a kind of like a role model for me back then in my mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. Hear, hearing her story because she come from like a humble background. She don't have any form of support. Uh, despite having financial difficulty, there was no organization that was helping her financially. And yet... She's running one of the biggest um, NGO uh, in Namibia, in, in the whole, uh, wow. yeah, in Namibia, the biggest NGO in Namibia. So, so and, and she looked up to me at that point of time. She looked, really? She looked, uh, no, I mean like physically she looked up to me. Oh, right, uh, right. <laughs> and, and she said, uh, Hazit, you have a lot of crazy ideas that you, that, that you want to do, but why don't you work on it, right? Uh, and there's one thing that she said that really, really, really punches me and forced me to act. Mm. She said, she asked me, uh, when a silkworm dies, it leaves behind silk for people to use. But when you die, what are you going to leave for the people around you? You know, and it, it oh. really strikes deep into me. Right, right, uh, right, right. That's a good you know, like, one, man. Yeah, yeah, like, damn. And, and that, that forms a part of um, my, my motto in life, actually. Really to build value for those around me. So, so when that happened, uh, I, I quit, uh, I, I was forced to pick an education to study. I went mm-hmm. to SMU and I said, imagine as someone who is being forced by his parents to study, you didn't know what you want to do. What is the first thing that will come up at the back of your head? You're forced to study, right? If, if it's you, you're forced mm-hmm. to study by your parents. What would you do? What would you study? Wow. Um... Or your thought process. Yeah, whatever. I think I would choose whatever that's easiest to study, easiest okay. to just pass. Yeah. Okay. 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 Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, for me, I was like, damn. If I'm forced to study, um, which job will give me the highest pay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's smart. That's so, smart. So I googled highest paying graduate job in Singapore. It came out, uh, and there was recommendation information systems. Uh, from SMU, applied for that, got in, uh, two weeks, I went nuts, I hated it so much, <laughs> when I was in the shower, I start thinking of it, you know, when I'm eating, I think of it, because it's just a very disciplined, different di- discipline from who I am, Yeah, I like, I like to question, uh, and in this discipline, you, you can't really do that, like for example, I will ask my prof, um, why is the programming done this way? Uh, but there's no answer to that because mm-hmm. uh, the guy that decides that the program to be done that way, that's how he does it, right? But it's, it's I don't know, like, I feel like a part of me is like sucked into this void when I don't get the mm-hmm. answer. Mm-hmm. So I felt that it's just not a discipline for me. I left in two weeks. Uh, I, met a, yeah, I, I, I met one of the school counselors and I, I shared with him that, you know, I don't think this is for me. I want to explore my passion and stuff like that. And he was like, oh, um, I have a friend, a few friends that have actually done that. Um, you know, and they are, and end up running successful businesses or doing their own thing. Um, but I would say, meet me next week uh, again and let's discuss about it. Mm-hmm. The moment like, I, I heard him say yes, I was like, oh yeah. Like I went up to the office opposite, all right, I'm resigning from school. Uh, <laughs> and the very day went back, I told my parents and they flipped. It was so <laughs> crazy, they flipped. Uh, yeah, so, so during that point of time, uh, I told my parents about it. They, they weren't really happy about it, of course. Yep. Because um, I guess the narrative is that university and then work, right? But, but I told him that yes. there's, there's not just one path to success. There's many paths to success, uh, right? Uh, and in fact, you heard of Grown Up Initiative? Yeah. So, so Lihawk... Um, Used to share with uh, used to share with me about his life, 
right? Uh, how travel have actually changed him, right? Mm. Uh, I couldn't really recall it very, very well, but it goes along, uh, uh, along this line of narrative. Yeah. So he was sharing with me how he, he was an accountant of sorts um, and he wanted to go backpacking or travel, right? Yep. Uh, I think it was supposed to be a few months and he come back a few years later and his travel journey changed him so much, his value, his outlook on life. And when he came back, that's when he built a ground up initiative. Yeah. Mm. Um, and that's exactly what I shared with my parents, right? I, I shared with them like, I could, I could follow the narrative that, that everyone follow, but it's not going to be giving me the fulfillment that I want. Right. Um, and, and, and I told him like, imagine our life to be a circle, to be a circle, right? If you always follow that boundary, we, the, the room for growth is always within this circle. And I told him, there are many plots of gold here, right? Uh, or here, or here, right? But it's complete darkness outside, right? But the moment you step out of it, the, the straight way you step out, you might be banged by a car, a lorry, or, or, or whatever, you know? Uh, but get back up, get back up, because if you walk enough, you might hit that pot of gold. Uh, and that, that, that gold doesn't have to be money. Like, it's, it's just a reference. It, it, it could be something that, that makes you happy. Uh, some sort of fulfillment for you. Yeah. So I mm. ended up going to India um, mm. during that period of time. Uh, Why India, I, man? Right. Uh, India chose me, man. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Uh, back then, actually, I wanted to go to Egypt. Uh, mm-hmm. I wanted to, to, to continue my Arabic. I was, I was learning Arabic back then. So like, it would be cool to go to Egypt to, to learn Arabic. Mm. Uh, but then they had the revolution happening there. It wasn't safe. Uh, and then I thought like, India is quite an interesting place because uh, my grandparent, uh, my grandfather, in fact, was actually from Punjab and then moved to Pakistan. Oh, all right. Okay. Uh, and I heard a lot of... Um, negative stuff about India, right? And I was like, are you sure it is what it is? Like, so I decided to go there. Mm-hmm. Uh, partly inspired, yeah, partly inspired by like a few shows that I watched as well. So I ended up going there and it was crazy. Uh, I didn't have much money. I worked for like, I don't know, like four or five months or so. Ended up going there uh, for a period of a year, right? You stayed in India for one year? Yeah, like the, the average wow. length I was, I was there, it's like a, a year. So, so when I was there, there are times when I had no money, I had to really survive. I worked in like a random guest house in a desert. I was, I was a camel guide. I was bringing tourists to the desert in a camel. Uh, it wow. was crazy. I, was, I, I spent a lot of time in, in artisanal communities, in fact. Like, I didn't have a map of like a plotted out map where I want to go. So it was really free and easy. So I spent mm. a lot of time staying in the kampong, staying with gypsies. I stay in the mountains with like literally like, um, if, if you look at my Instagram, there's one photo of two guys, probably like at 3,800 meters high in the mountain. And they just live there. Two old guys with like wow. a bunch of ships. So, so it was, it was, it was wow. a very interesting part of yeah. my life because, because our, our, our goals uh, in the society, is always, I don't know, uh, it could be material wealth or, 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 or whatever that is. But these guys, they have like a completely different ideology in life. Yep. You know? so, so it kind of like broadens your horizon yeah. there. Uh, but, but the turning point was this. Um, I went on a hike. Right? Uh, do you watch Into the Wild? No. Oh um, man, don't watch that. You're going to throw your life away. <laughs> I, okay. I, yeah. What about it? Uh, okay, so so into the life is basically like uh, it's about this guy who just said screw the society, uh, screw how it is run, the chase for money, wealth. He breaks his credit card, burn his cash, and just went into the wild, right? To experience what what uh, he will term as happiness. He was trying to find happiness, right? And I was like, damn, like maybe that's what I should do. Uh, I've <laughs> I've. I've never been to Himalayas, nor have I ever hiked a mountain of that sort. So, so I thought that, you know what, I, I, I should do it regardless. Like, I, I received training when I was in the army. I know how to navigate. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. So, I packed my bags for, for nine days. 
and I wanted to be drastic. I was like, oh, that guy didn't use any kind of like uh, GPS or whatever. Like, you know, I should not rely on that. I had a com- <laughs> compass. I had a- <laughs> yeah, I was young and foolish. I was wow. all very foolish. I had a compass. I had a map and I had a guidebook. I just went there for the next nine days. The moment the jeep dropped me off, I just like, shit, I'm screwed. <laughs> you know, like just the grandeur, like the magnificence of the mountain. It's, it's so crazy. And I'm just like a tiny speckle there. And then hey, without the first, any guide, nothing. Nothing, 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 nothing. Wow. Nothing. And the only way out is nine days. Nine days out. Before you find another life form. Yeah. And, and the craziest part was like, the first part of the hike, you have like a huge ass river. Um, you, you know like the Longkang in Singapore, right? Like when, yeah. when there's a lot of like rain and the water just gush, gush yeah, yeah. down. It's that kind of speed, but it's a huge river. And you have this pail. You need to step on the pail and there's a pulley system and you just pull. And you just go like, eh, 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 eh. Oh, like, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So the first part, I was really like, damn, like how am I supposed to like go past this? Uh, just like a while in, I think 30, 40 minutes in, I got lost. I got completely lost. Obviously. Like, yeah, like, and I don't understand why because I was following the map. You know, like, the, like there was one part of the hike where there's no way for you to move forward. It's either you go straight and then it's a dead end or you cross the huge river to go on the other side where there was a pathway. So mm. when I crossed, what happened was um, I got washed away by the river because the river is so huge and the velocity at the center, right? Um, of the river is like so fast. I had a backpack that was that that, that was um you know buckled to my chest, a hiking stick, and yeah. it pushed me. The 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 rubble below slipped. It pushed me, and I got washed. And at that moment, it sounds quite cliche, but mm-hmm. at that moment, right, I knew that that is it. Uh, like it's it's my time to go. Yeah, you know. So so I was really like that tengah mengucap and stuff like that. Okay. Was, okay, God, God, take my life. Like, like I know this is it. Uh, and 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 I know that that was the time because at that moment, I see myself as a kid. So not as a first person, as a third person, I see myself as a kid with my parents, my yeah. siblings. Um, and and it was so scary. It was so scary. So and 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 after a while, suddenly like my my back bump into something huge and I realized that oh like I'm, I'm still yeah. here I thought like why am I not not dead yet yeah. so, so apparently like I got washed to the other side of the river and there was a huge boulder and my backpack got stuck so I, I, I still had my hiking sticks in hand I was able to yank myself out but I was like hyperventilating I was like breathing very very heavily like, I had to regulate my breathing to not hyperventilate and it was super cold yeah uh, yeah, so I changed on to a new piece and stuff like that. But, but, but I guess the main reason being why I want to tell you this story is because that was the turning point in my life, right? Mm. Because, because that point of time, whatever that my friend, her name is Tikala, from the, the one from Africa, really, it, it really like rang to my ear. Like, what happened if that was the day that I was gone? Right? Like, again, yeah. what do you leave for the people around you? And, 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 and when I was about to to die per se, yeah. the first thing that came to my mouth was like image of my parents, image of my siblings. Uh, and the question is that what have you done literally for the people around you? You don't have to look at the community, but even your family members, right? Yeah. What kind of a son are you and what kind of a friend or something like that, right? Exactly, exactly. Uh, so that whole experience when I was in India, uh, staying with all these rural community, uh, they took me in and the question rang back, what can I do for them, right? Because when I go to the village there, um, they ran up to me the first time. They didn't ask me for money. This is like really, really deep village area where yeah. they have never even seen a watch. Oh, they look okay. at the watch in my hand. All the people start crowding and like, what is that? Yeah. You know? So, so the first thing that they asked for me was, they want a pen. Yeah. They, they want something to write. And I thought mm-hmm. that that was weird. You know? Uh, and they took me in. Uh, despite not having anything much, they took me in to stay with them. Uh, they gave me like food. They only eat two times a day. They, they do not afford three times a day. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I got to experience a bit of their life and I thought that it's not right for me to just go back to Singapore and not do anything about it. 
right? Yeah. Because yeah. because I believe that we are endowed or we are blessed with resources in Singapore. Yep. At the very least, I could do something to impact a small amount of um, change for them, mm-hmm. right? So when I got back, uh, I I thought to myself that you know what, uh, at that community, most of the parents are very very talented artisans, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they have been doing it for like three to four generations. Yeah. Uh, it started off like your grandfather, their great grandfather. Uh, but previously they were doing shoes, mm-hmm. uh, right? Uh, but then I thought that that the shoes that they do, it's very, very traditional to Rajasthan and not everybody wears that kind of shoe. So how can that uh, skill, leather shoe, how can that skill be applied back uh, to add value for people to want to buy, mm-hmm. right? So, so, so at that point of time, uh, the problem with school is that they do not have a toilet at all. So imagine that you must go to school huh? um, and the school, there's no roof at all. Uh, it's literally like just soil, and then when when the kids say that they want to go to the toilet, you pick it, you, you go to the backyard. Uh, literally, it's just one wall, and you do your business there. You defecate there, you pee there. There's absolutely like very little hygiene standards because they could not afford a toilet, uh, and it's not safe even for like ladies because they do it there as well, right? And and it's not like that's gonna be our first project. Mm. We we, 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 we worked a little bit, we get a little bit of finance and we tell the attendants, you know what, let's create this back, you know, and let's sell it back at home. Back then, I was in my, I just got back to my university, I was in my first year um, and it was a limited amount of bags we sold and people loved it, right? Uh, and then the more people loved it, uh, we used that cash, we, we rolled it over to buy more inventory to create more products. And then we thought, you know what, this could be, this could be something, you know. Uh, and our first goal was we wanted to create a toilet for these kids. We want to build fan for them. Mm-hmm. We want to improve the school infrastructure because yeah. right now there's no safe water supply. Uh, kids can't go to school when the weather is crazy because they're staying in a desert area, right? So, so we did that. We did a bit of crowdfunding um, and we managed to raise. So we, we did that for the school. Uh, oh. We managed to hit all, all the KPIs. And then the artisans from, from uh, not gaining any income. Previously, they were hired to work in farms, but they're not paid salary. They are paid meals. Can you imagine that? So, so, yeah, exactly. Like, there is no way for social mobility yeah, yeah, if yeah. you're only being paid meals. Yes. Right? So, so, we wanted to change that. Uh, and I was very, very passionate about poverty back then. Right? So, so few ways to, to improve on poverty in a particular area is that uh, education, employment, infrastructure, healthcare. Target four of this. Right. You target minimally two out of four, you could see a significant difference in um, their living standards. And that's what Project Nomad was founded upon. Right? Like we want to reach out to all these isolated societies because they are not at the core focus of the main uh, of, of like big city centers, right? They're not bringing income. Yep. Uh, so we want to reach out to this area and build value for them, build a form of livelihood for them, uh, get, out, get them out of poverty. So by that same model, there's two things we target. Model number one, we actually target uh, to allow them to earn a decent living wage, right? That's number one. Uh, in areas that people don't even earn. And number two, we target one of the other three things. It could be education, it could be infrastructure or it could be healthcare. Mm. Yeah. So, so our model is, 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 is more of um, when, you, when, when you buy a product uh, in a period of uh, a month, every time when we, when, when we go to the community, we will sit down. In, instead, instead of like just saying that, oh, I'm going to give you uh, $30, do whatever you want with it. Uh, or like, oh, I'm going to buy you clothes. Yeah. That's the social impact. But instead, we, we make an effort to go there. We sit down with them. We sit down with their village head and, and we chat with them. What do you actually need? Right? Mm. Uh, what does the community actually need? And, and we do it wow. every time. So, yeah. Is, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Pre- pretty much, that's, that's how Project Nomad started. So, it's literally just you working direct with the villagers and, and these people and ask them what they want. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. Wow, I think I think that is something that I was thinking about also. Like you know, sometimes you you want to help help <clears throat> these people right out of poverty, and then but you actually you liars with for example the government and stuff like that. But then that money doesn't really go to them, and the government don't really go down to their level and ask what are the things that really they really need, right? But yeah. you guys, you guys really go right to the source, and you guys you know ask what's their problem and stuff. And wow, I think that is. <clears throat> That is a lot of hard work, and that is really, yeah. really the true, I think the true ideal way to really help someone out of poverty. So, like, how, how do you guys? Um, because that is just one village in yeah. one state or something. Like that. How, like, yeah. how do you? Are you? Are there, are there plans for other, you know, other villages as well, other other places as well? Definitely, definitely. Um, I think India was one of the toughest places. And it was also the beginning uh, of of where our work sprouted from. The culturally, it's it's very very different. Navigating uh, deals that's very very different, you know. And and I'm working with a community that has a very different way of life than myself, right? So so the so so India was a, a really like a crazy learning point from yeah. from. What is their value system? It's very important to know that when you're working with them, to their mm-hmm. culture, all the yes. little nuances, right? Um, and and working with them, you eventually you kind of like manage to build systems and structures um, in your head on how this should be. So, for example, mm-hmm. in India, because uh, a lot of them are really good at what they're doing, they're really experienced in some way or another. Uh, they said that you know what we don't want an income uh we want to be partners right mm. like we, we want to be partners we want to be uh paid per product right it's like fine like if that's what you want that's what i'm gonna give right um and and, and money was good for them right because mm-hmm. because we're, we're we're bringing their craft out and we're bringing it back uh higher yeah. currency value yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's for India, but then eventually, of course, you, you, you pick up learning points, you know, what is the pros of doing this partnership model? Because, because sometimes for them, uh, they, they don't think of it as a, a long game, right? They don't think of like legacies for their children. They think of it as, senang cakap, um, kais pagi makan pagi, I've done enough back, I don't want to work anymore. You know, yep. Um, yep. and they said, I want to stop. But when you stop them, a few months later, like, they come begging you like, please, mm-hmm. like, I want to work with you and so on and so forth. And you realize that you need to work out a, a more sustainable model, like how to go about doing this. Yeah. Um, so with whatever experience that we have made in India, we moved into Jogja. Oh, right, right, right now we're in Jogja as well. We expanded to Jogja. So, nice, so nice. India happened uh, for a period of time, I think about two to three years. Uh, and Alhamdulillah, we we structured India such that they are able to produce big quantity. They know they know how they, they literally have many factories now, micro factories. Nice, nice, nice. Right. So, like, imagine like wow. one house, two house, three house, four house. Um, yeah. Um, and and they're directly licensing with uh, distributors from Europe already. Okay, yeah. So nice. So, so imagine like they have thousand bags. Uh, going to Europe every month. Is it uh, under you guys or they themselves liars with their own, that's their own set of profits? We let them stand on their own feet. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. They, they, they've already reached that level. I think, I think that's the, 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 the idea. At the, bank, at, at the end of the day, uh, we are not in it to, to, to really make money with this. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, of course, there needs to be some kind of uh, business sustainability, but but the social mission is for them to be able to empower their own community, and right. the fact that they are able to stand on their own feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm 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 really proud of 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 that. Yeah. So so they have like thousand bags shipped to Europe every month. Uh, they're on Amazon and, and stuff like that. Nice, they have man. they have like more than thirty artisans right now. Uh, a group. So, so yeah, um, with that in mind, I was in Indonesia. I wanted to learn how to do leather crafting mm-hmm. because, because the, way, the way they craft, it's still very, very traditional, right? I want to improve their skill set. So when I was there, um, I met a friend in, in Jakarta, like the main city area, and she says that 
oh, uh, my husband worked with this community, used to work with this community, they really needed the help. Uh, farmer earns 200 USD for an entire year. Could you imagine that? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, then I was like, okay, cool. Like, um, because she mentioned that they are really, really good craftsmen. Right? Literally, could you imagine like uh, wooden spectacles? Spectacles, right? Yeah. They craft everything by hand. Wow. Spectacles. Uh-huh. So they're really, really talented. Uh, that's when I, I moved there. Um, we stayed with them for like a period of one month, get to know them, and then mm-hmm. come back again. That, that, that part is interesting because it's who I am. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, 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 I like speaking to people, understanding their culture. Uh, and there's a lot of that. They call it uh, Silatul Rahmi there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so after that process, we felt that there was a match. And we decided, that, you know what? Let's build something here. Let, let's improve the community. And the main person that I liaised with, he had the same mentality. So he's very progressive. I would think that he's mm-hmm. a mad scientist. <laughs> because his wife was sharing he, really man like he's crazy yeah. like, before I met him uh, his wife was telling me that he was mixing chemical outside his house and there was smoke coming out <laughs> and stuff like that <laughs> it's really crazy uh, you know like those metal plate like yeah. jam, your, your Nike punya I don't know uh, sleepers or sandals or whatever there's that metal plate with the Nike logo mm-hmm. he makes the entire thing from scratch the machine at the kampong so the machine that produced that? Yeah, he, 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 he looked at it. He was figuring out how to make that. He buy like a few stuff. He assembles something and he makes it. <laughs> wow. uh, and then, and then uh, basically biofuel or, or, or biodiesel. So, so basically, um, you know, like in Kampong, the toilet is still the kind where you, yeah. you, you gully the tana and stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. He create a tube that goes all the way up uh, such that you can use it to to burn fire and mass up like as, as, as a gas <laughs> wow and this guy had no formal education at all he has uh-huh, always uh-huh. been staying in a kampong yeah wow uh, amazing, man. yeah so he's your partner in Indonesia yes correct you correct uh-huh. and everything yeah so so in every community that we work with you always I identify a partner uh, that really believe in what we do that really want to improve the community um, and I guess our work in, like, I'm, I'm satisfied with our work in Indonesia because mm-hmm. when we started to work with them, they, they had like not much idea on crafting at all, mm-hmm. right? Like it's still pretty much uh, unsystemized, unstructured. Not everybody knows. So we spent a period of one year. We buy like, you know, metal stuff. We literally like built uh, the the mini factory from scratch with our own hands. Like I was there, we do uh-huh. welding and stuff like that. Uh-huh. But that, that, that is the fun part, you know. Uh, yeah, we work yeah, day yeah. and night together. Um, and, then, and then it's just like prototyping for a period of one to make sure that their skills are really, really awesome. Like it's really, really great. To the point where like today, all of them are able to stand on their own feet and they're able to produce products that, that is really good quality. Uh, I don't know if mm-hmm. I have my... Okay, I'm, I'll, I'll show it to you later. Yeah. The product yeah. is it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. This like this is one of the product. Wow. Yeah, and it's and 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 like stuff like that. It's actually like crafted by hand. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So wow. yeah, really proud of their progress. Amazing. This is from Indonesia. The Georgia. This is from this is from Indonesia. So so the benefit of having that uh factory there, like even during COVID, right? Much um, all the people in the village they couldn't mm-hmm. really um, they, they have no idea about masks and, and stuff like that um, and us being in contact with our artisans right like we were always chatting with them so for a moment a momentary period of time like our mini factory becomes a production hub for to mask. create masks wow yeah for them they, they can create that bag masks is like what masks <laughs> right masks is like nothing for them <laughs> yeah like yeah Exactly, exactly. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, wow. And and I think the satisfaction you get, you know, uh, from see their progress and now standing at, at their own feet, right? I think that is something that nothing can buy. Uh, and wow, really kudos to you on that, man. Thank you, man. <laughs> so uh, are there, uh, what are the 
uh, what are the plans for you guys in the future? Maybe expanding to other countries also, or but I mean, I understand that you have to. It takes a lot of your time, right? Like you said yeah. just now, you have to you have to sit there for you know stay there for one one year month just to get to know them, get make sure mm-hmm. that, that vision and belief is together, right? So yeah, are you are you gonna? Um, there's always there's always that um idea that we want to help uh more south, right? yeah more, more southeast asian communities like literally like building these like small little huts um in in areas that people do not have income or do not have uh, have a very low standard of living but after going through india uh, india like it it helps me to structure my thoughts better like i want to go deep with one community first mm-hmm. go deep in a in a sense that um identify specifically how the impact could be deeper, grow it, have some roots whereby it's able to stand up on their own feet, uh, and then move to another community. Because India alone and Indonesia is too small of a sample size for me to have proper learnings from it. Right. Yeah, Got so it. I want to read it down first. But, but uh, of course, we, we have a few communities in mind uh, that we have already been in touch with. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just a matter of when we want to move there. All right, right, got it, got it. Wow, okay, amazing. Um, so now, um, okay, maybe we can share a bit about uh, you know, life as as a uh nomad, right? They call it a nomad, and right. you know, you backpacking and stuff. You know, I I myself for one, I tried it once backpacking. You know, I enjoyed mm. it, and you yeah. know, maybe you can share from your experience or advice for those who never tried it before. Right. What What can they expect? Uh, expect the unexpected. <laughs> um, well, well, I guess there's there's always a like a big uh, obstacle in front of you before you want to do it. You feel scared. Um, there's a lot of people that's gonna say that it's gonna be unsafe. Uh, yeah. It's gonna be. It's gonna be there's, there's always gonna be that. And 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 I don't disagree with them that at some point of time it could be unsafe. But you know that's what it is. Like. Like, if there's no risk, there's no gains, right? Um, and there are ways for you to do it in a way that it becomes a very safe process for you. Like, like for me personally, um, I was a little bit nervous at first. There were times when I was in India that I almost got dragged into a jail before, uh, during my very first trip, you know? Oh. But all this become like huge, crazy stories and learning experiences for yeah. me. I, yeah. I would definitely recommend it uh, for, for, for people depending on on what kind of travel you want to do like like I guess before you even travel you need to have like an idea of like what is the purpose of this trip like mm-hmm. if you go there and you end up like you know your backpacking is that every day you go to the cafe and like <laughs> go shopping I think that defeats the purpose of backpacking yeah you know you want to really immerse yourself um, see other people's ideas values culture um, and, and for me personally, I felt that, you know how um, it's always easy for us to look at other people and then spot where their mistakes are and we are not able to do that personally within ourselves. When, when you are in your own society, there's this thing called deviant typology by Robert Merton. When you're in your own society, right, uh, you conform to how a society think, how a society believe, right? Um, and then there are a few people in the deviant typology. Deviant, basically someone that does not conform to the society. It could be bad, it could be good, right? Mm-hmm. For example, yeah. hippies, hippies yeah, yeah. they are considered deviant because their goal is different from the mainstream society and their mean to achieve the goal is also different, yeah. right? Whereas like, there's other group of people called innovators. Mm-hmm. Uh, that could be people like uh, Steve Jobs, for example, yeah. right? He have the same goal but different means. Right, and when you are so entrenched deep down into your society for a period of time, the ideology of society right, just crawls into you, uh, such that the way your mind is being framed, it's pretty much becomes like that one dimensional to a mm-hmm. certain degree, whether you are conscious or subconscious. But for me personally, I be, uh, it has worked out for me. Every time when I get out of that, I enter a mental state whereby I'm no longer governed by that defining societal belief. When mm-hmm. I go out there, I see other possibilities. Like, you know, this society, they are doing this. Um, yeah. 
this is how they run their business or like this is how they live their life. Uh, and that becomes an opportunity, right? For me to realize like, you know what? While my goal is the same as my society, there are multiple means to achieve that. Um, mm. And it helps you to innovate better, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice, uh, nice. I don't know if I did answer your question, man. I'm so sorry. Like you no, I think, I, about... I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, okay, maybe, maybe more technical in terms of, for example, those, you know, you said that uh, if you want to do backpacking and you just want to go to the cafes and you just want to go to the beach and relax, right? Okay. So how, for those who wants to really, like, really connect with the, the locals there, right? Right. But, where do they start? Like, how do I okay. they just don't knock on doors or something like that, right? So, uh, yeah. 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 So, so how do they start? Yeah. Okay, for, for me, like, I'm a big nature person. Literally, every trip that I go, I will always, always, always go to nature. Uh, so, so, I, so the, main, the main thing in mind, never go with a concrete plan. Like, mm. never plan that I'm going to go from point A to point B to point C to point D because... Mm high chances are whatever that you see on Lonely Planet, whatever that you Google, those are basically routes that other tourists have, yeah. have taken up. They could yeah. be basically a, a, a commercial places that, that you will end up in. So usually what I do is that I have an area. For example, for India, it's like uh, I will fly into uh, Mumbai, right? So from Mumbai, I, I keep it free and easy. Um, I will chat with like, I, I stay a lot in backpacking dorms. Instead mm. of hotels, uh, because that's when like you could really interact even with right. like the guest house uh, owner and stuff like that. So you start chatting with them. You start chatting with, like, like the waiter in like I don't know, like the mama at the side of the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Start chatting with them, and they'd be like, uh, most of them they end, they, they 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 love talking to you. And they're like, yeah. oh, like you know, I have a kampong here. Like it's a beautiful, it's an amazing place. Uh, um, and then tell them like, what what do you want to experience? What do you want to see? And then you're like, okay, I recommend this place. Mm. You know, like, why don't you come to my village? Yeah. Let, let, let's do it. I don't have a plan. Let's do it. Right, you go right, there, right, you know? Right, right, uh, right, right. Yeah, you just go there, you experience it. And sometimes you met certain travelers that have gone off track. Mm-hmm. And they're like, you should experience it. And just go do it. Right, right, right. So that's the way, that's the... Because, because sometimes, you know, we, 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 when we go to these countries, right? And then we also have those, like, the... the how to say those locals that they just want you for the money or they just you know want to angle you in a way with bad intentions right so that is what yeah. you don't want to fall into that trap exactly uh one thing i realized is that 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 tourist trap thing right um it's basically because of uh urbanization and then there's mm-hmm. this whole push pull factor whereby people from rural areas the or, or, or other parts of the country that has slums, poor people, they move towards urban areas with the promise that urban areas will grant them jobs. All right. Um, and sometimes when jobs are, are, are limited, there's going to be like a creation of slums, people start to yeah. get desperate. Um, and then that's when that kind of stuff happens. It happens, yeah. But when you move to rural areas, you see that people are super duper different. People are really, really nice. Like, like, for example, in India, um, they have this saying that a guest is equivalent to uh, a god or the friend of God. So they really treat you very, very well. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, like, I felt like the hospitality was really amazing. It's, yeah. like, it's like, you know, like you, you go to one, uh, I, I stayed with one grandparent before. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were so happy to have me because they, 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 their grandson was away. Yeah. Uh, oh, so they treat you like he's a grandson. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like every morning will wake me up and then they will make me like chapati. They will make me rice and then they have like three to four different dishes. And then she even make me like homemade Indian ice cream. You know? Wow. And, and even like when you makan your food already, right? Like they keep pushing you more, 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 more. And you just have to like, you know, it's enough, it's enough. Uh, but that's the kind of like experience that I enjoy. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. You know, like their daily life. So sometimes, like, macam the the water tank on top of the house. So it's like it's like those uh two story house that uh, on top the water tank is exposed, right? Yeah. The water gets jammed, and then she will shout out from you like Hazik, <laughs> and then like ask you to go out and like fix the water tank. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. 
Eh, at the end of the day, you you there's story to tell lah. Like, there's always story to tell back home. You know, all all these experiences, right? Like especially yeah. for this podcast also. The way the way you story, it's just it's just exciting lah like, to hear. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. 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 Definitely. <clears throat> okay. So um, next question will be: What's your best business lesson you have learned throughout your journey? Best business lesson. Uh. Wow. There's a lot of lessons, but let me see. I guess the best business lesson is always remember um, customer first. Like when I talk about customer, it means value first, right? There's there's always a tendency or a, a form of entitlement that when you want to do something, uh, you have this idea at the back of your head, mm-hmm. and 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 when you have that idea, you just be like, okay, damn, like you know, this is exciting. I'm gonna make this work. And then you start like after you start making it, and then you go to your customers, right? Mm-hmm. So, so so when you do that, basically you are not exactly, you might not be building something that they want, right? I I felt that the primary, the 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 primary reason for business existence is basically to create value, right? So when you talk about people buying your product or the process of like marketing your products, right? Basically you are trying to exchange value with people. Right, exchange value in the form of like I'm giving you value in terms of like this bottle, yeah. and in return you're returning it back with money, uh, because you value this. Yeah. Right. So I guess that's that's the biggest uh lesson. That means everything has to be customer centric before you start your business, before you create your product. Speak to the people. Uh, what do they need? How can you improve their life? What their values are. Maybe maybe some tips from your side. How do you um how do you you know uh talk to the customers on what they want? Like what channels do you go to? Yeah. Um, it actually really depends on business to business. Uh, so so for me, um, I would create focus groups. Number one, number two. Uh, for, okay. Imagine if I don't have um, I don't have the cash, for example, I don't have the cash, uh, nor do I have uh, a business that is already up and running, right? I would find people within my circle to chat to that I think would be my prospective customers or the target market that I want to work with, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the way that you frame your question, it should be open-ended. It should be, it should be in the form of story rather than asking a yes or no question. For example, um, instead of asking, how do you usually um, how do you usually drink from a bottle? Like, do you prefer caps on or caps off? You, that's that's really a very specific question. No. Uh, instead, you could you could ask a question that is more of like, uh, what is your experience like? Um, you know, when you're really really thirsty uh, and then you you want to drink a water, like, what what is the experience like? Yeah. Uh, and then, and then from that process, that you know, uh, it becomes a storytelling. And when when it becomes a story, you could pick the nuances out. And these nuances are the important stuff, because when you ask them, you like it to be like with a cap on or drink directly without a cap on. Yeah. You you are limiting their problems to that two options. Yeah. Yeah. Right, you get right, coming right. from right? I, yep. Yep. Totally. Totally. I mean, there's frameworks for it, lah. I guess the one that everybody or like something that is very hyped about right now or even like before that was design thinking. Um, mm. And there, there, there are values in there in, in how you approach customers. I'm pretty sure a lot of people are really doing that, but that is just a structured process mm-hmm, on how mm-hmm. to do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So um, you have experience in sales and marketing, right? Maybe yeah. uh, let's talk about that and maybe what your tips on that for maybe businesses who were struggling with their marketing or their sales. Any advice on that? Uh, digital? Yes. Or, sure. Okay. Um, I would say the tip number one, it's, it's a very general tip, invest sure. in knowledge. Invest in knowledge. Um, a lot of people, when, when they started off, when they talk about sales and marketing, you just keep thinking that it's about boosting Facebook sales, right? <laughs> they, they, uh, having an, an understanding of funnels, um, right. having understanding of a customer lifetime value 
helps you to go far, right? Mm. Uh, when, when I just started out, there's always this problem is like, how do I bring in traffic? Like, like, how do I reach out people outside of my circle? Yeah. Right? And in today's day and age, traffic is never a problem. Like, in the past, traffic is always a problem because how do you reach out to other people? But today, you can buy traffic. Yeah. You know? So, so I, will, I, will, I will advise them, like, when it comes to marketing effort, the number one thing is that always identify who are your customers, your customer persona. When you are trying to attract or when every customer is your customer, you have no customer. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to know who your customers are. That's where, that's, that's, that's where your focus is going to be. And then you create a proper funnel from there. Um, I don't think I can share in detail. Sure, sure, sure. no problem, no problem. Yeah. Entire, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a rough guide. Yeah, I think that, that's, that's really good. Uh, you're just, just that, that advice. Okay, so um, other than Project Nomad, right? Yep. So what are the things that you have invested your time on? Uh, right now, yeah? Yeah. Uh, right now, I'm based in Malaysia. Uh, I'm working on, on basically a stealth startup here. Um, mm-hmm. Basically a, a startup. And we're working on becoming um, an end-to-end celebrity merchandising system. So, right. so that means we're actually building brands for celebrities. Uh, right so nice, nice. yeah so we want to be a brand uh, a brand builder uh, for the Southeast Asia market and the niche celebrity products cool 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 so how long have you been doing that already I've been here for about a year right now um, okay, yeah building this and build, how build, many, building this are you, are you uh, doing alone or do you have a team with you yeah I, I have uh, basically partner and investors nice yeah, wait so, wait awesome awesome yeah, 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 yeah. So, so when you're building Project Nomad, you're based in Malaysia or you're based in Singapore? Right um, I was in Singapore. Like Project Nomad was since 2015, we started uh, testing waters. 2016, we incorporated. So it's some time back, um, I was in Singapore. Uh, you but during travel there, right? And stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, but during that point of time, I moved back and forth between Malaysia. In, because in my first year of uni, I was doing my internship with Malaysian Global Innovation and Creativity Center. It's like a startup ecosystem here. And then eventually, like when I was in my second rotate of Project Nomad, um, I was employed by Tom's to run the, their Singapore business and their head office for the for between Singapore and Malaysia is in Malaysia. Mm. So I go I, I go there quite frequently like, for meetings right, and stuff. Right, right. So why why did you leave Singapore to to start uh, another business in, in Malaysia? Why why not just, you know, start in Singapore? Um, damn. <laughs> I guess... <laughs> Let's see. Okay, I guess one of the main uh, reasons is because I felt that my market is bigger in Malaysia. Uh, there's bigger value for me to provide in Malaysia with the business that I'm doing, mm. right? Um, that's number one, uh, sure. market size. Number two, uh, there's definitely like more celebrities uh, that would yeah. would prefer right, uh, right, these right. businesses compared to Singapore because the entertainment industry is pretty small. Yeah. Um, and of course, the startup cost is pretty low for me here. Uh, as as a startup, I could be more lean um, and 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 lower capital spending. Yeah. Right here. Yeah, so are, are, you, are you guys registered in your company registered in Malaysia? Or yeah, it's registered, Malaysia? it's registered in Malaysia. Yeah. Right, right, right. We we might open up a Singapore entity. Um mm. but yeah, we'll we'll see. Oh interesting. So you're you're juggling with both of that right now. Yep. Uh no that, yeah. I, I, I'm doing both, but again, uh my, my main focus right now is this stuff startup. Basically I'm working on it full time. Um mm. yeah. So do uh, like are you what like do you man? miss do you miss like traveling and speaking with you know all these rural rural people and do you do you have a plan to 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 visit them again when 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 would it be? Yeah, uh, we we chat quite often, me and my artisans. Mm, um, nice. Yeah, we we chat quite often, uh, and of course, I have plans to 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 go back there because we have a, a new project that we want to work on. But because right now um, the borders are closed in, in, in Jogjakarta, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't enter yet. 
Yeah. But definitely, I, 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 I miss it. And I think there's always time to do that. Um, you know, like I just need to commit a time, a period of like yeah. two to three days. Jog Jakarta is not as far as India. Right, right, right. Yeah. But it's a lot easier, you know, like, you know, when I was in India, because they're staying like in a desert area, right? There's, mm-hmm. there's literally like no phone connection. Mm. So he has to like tompang a guy that have a bike to go somewhere with connection. For the, for the signal, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then do a WhatsApp call. So, so when you want to do a, a call, it's like we, we need to plan, okay, every Thursday this timing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite I cool. can imagine that. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. Okay, so we come to more the section where I'm going to ask you more about your personal uh personal answers. All right. Okay, what's your definition of a meaningful life? Um I guess it goes back to my story earlier on, right? Um for me the definition of a meaningful life is to be able to add value to those around you. Uh and that 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 could be in so many ways, right? It could be people who come to you and ask for advice. It could be people that literally like you buy something from, right? The conversations that you had, if, if it's a thing or two that you said that impacted their life and that is it. So it really becomes a way of life for mm-hmm. me. Yeah. Nice. All right. Okay. Who are your role models and why? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I actually saw this question. Um, <laughs> For me personally, I don't have a specific role model. Like, sure. I don't have one person that I look up to. Uh, rather, I have a multitude, uh, many different sorts of people that I envision them as role models in, in a particular field or in a mm-hmm. particular like, character that they carry. Mm-hmm. So, sorry, that was my cat. No. <laughs> no so, uh, so, so, one of them, for example, was my friend Tikala. Um, the, the, the one that I met in, in, in US um, and then I have a few mentors that I look up to uh, basically entrepreneurship mentors that I look up to and then there are also like life mentors which is like mm. very, very very different uh, the, their outlook on life um, spirituality yeah. so yeah, it's different sorts of people I don't know like is it something that you, you envision when you talk about role models or do you have a different structure in your head? For me? Yeah. It depends actually. So different people give different answers. So I, 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 I truly respect your answers because, some, because you don't have like a one answer fits all kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, it's just, it's just interesting to know what's, what's, what, 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 are you, what are you thinking in terms of when a question pops up. Okay, uh, right, right. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, think, yeah, I think it's great. I think. Like for, for example, like if, if you talk about um, building e-commerce businesses there's this woman that i look up to called greta venriel uh that's one lady but if you're talking about marketing yeah other people that i look up to yeah yeah of course, uh, of course. Be, yeah because at the end of the day i feel that you understand that version of yourself of what you want to be or what you aspire to be and in order to get there uh i want to be I want to be like this person in this way, this person punya skill in this way. Yeah. Sure, sure. Okay, um, what, are, what areas in your life that you are weak at and you plan to improve? Um, it could be anything, right? Sure, of course. Okay, so for me, uh, I have this tendency, right? Like when I do work, I get so focused, I'm in my own zone uh-huh. uh, that sometimes like I don't eat and stuff. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then it's very bad for me because I have like uh, the th- certain times when I had gastric because I whoa, 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 mm-hmm. drink coffee and then tak makan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, bad. But that's for me. But for other people, it's also bad because when like people that I don't really know or like I'm not really close to, uh, for example, like, I'm working, right? And then you are talking to me and it's like, hey, like I'm, I'm living, like nice to see you, man. Uh, I didn't realize they're talking to me. Oh, okay. this is that bad because I'm so yeah, engrossed yeah, in something. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, so, yeah, so for yeah. people who don't know me, they might think that uh, I'm rude or like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like you know, uh, action. You know, because it, you're just in your element, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and even in social setting, it's bad. So I need to be able to differentiate that. For example, like um, I'm in the car or like sometimes even having dinner. 
mm-hmm. and then there's some work stuff to do. Mm-hmm. And then you just like pull out your phone and just like when conversations are happening, it's rude. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, so there's, 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 there's something that I, I'm working on. Yeah, yeah, okay. You're working on, huh? so I'm working not, on. I'm working on. <laughs> so it's, always, it's, it's always about work that uh, that happens, I guess, huh? Yeah, I, I I guess it's um it's just something that is with me since I was young. Like mm. like when I'm really like zoned into something or like I I'm really excited about something, I forget about everything. Uh, yeah. Yeah, totally can relate to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I ask these questions to all my guests at the end. What makes a great leader? What makes a great leader? What makes a great leader? Wow, this is a this is a big question, but I stand by what I say earlier, man. Um, I think again, a great leader is not one that takes. A great leader is someone that gives, right? So it it really goes back about providing value mm-hmm. because because the thing is that when you keep expecting something from people when you are being a leader right it's literally like to just suit your agenda and as a leader you're supposed to nourish someone you're supposed to guide them make them grow give them the opportunity to excel because when they excel you excel yeah correct correct yeah yeah nice so it goes it goes back to that um yeah Thank you, Hazik, for for you know uh, this this session. I really enjoy listening to your travel stories, especially. You know, yeah, I, thanks, I was man. like, you know, when you were sharing, I was like, you know, trying imagining, uh, you know, me in your shoes, especially the part where you saw, you know, death right in front of you, right, right. in two, three, yeah. Because I, 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 I myself is one who really loves traveling also and going to and connect with this kind of people. So I totally can relate to you. And traveling changes your perspective of life especially so sometimes once in a while it's good to just go out there and especially because most people see traveling as they, it's very planned right they just follow the road the same road and everything but this kind of traveling is just it's different it's a totally different way so yeah thank you for sharing and what an inspiring story i'm glad that i persistently you know <laughs> ask you to to, to come <laughs> on show and we'll be rescheduling a lot so yeah yeah finally, thank you thank you for this man any last parting words you want to say <clears throat> uh thanks man like um i guess my last parting words to you is that let's do it man if you want to experience that <laughs> we can really? climb the next mountain together uh, yeah yeah I, I would love to it but yeah I, I, I was actually looking to summit a mountain at the end of this year um it's a seven thousand meters mountain Mm-hmm. Wanted to submit it, and then this whole thing uh, happened. And I was like, "It's fine. It's an opportunity to train and wait for the right do, time." Do you, do you have to train? Do you have to train for that? Like, do oh, you train yeah. yourself? Yeah. Yeah, like seven thousand meters. It's it's crazy. Um, oh. You experience altitude sickness. It's a technical climb. You need to have the endurance. Uh, but, but it's a good but, goal, yeah. though. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's something yeah. to look forward to, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah, maybe, exactly. Maybe inshallah, maybe twenty twenty one, man. I I will join you, man. No, why not, man? You <laughs> yeah, you 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 do training as well, like you you're already fit. You're already fit. <laughs> no, no, it's different. This I remember, I I, I remember trying a, a a climb in in Bali, Mount Mount Agung. Okay. Yeah, and for me, I was like, wow, this is a different level of fitness, man. It needs a different kind of conditioning. So okay. I actually we we actually failed to we only reached like one third because my friend. My close friend, you know, he he gave up. So I cannot be selfish and go yeah. out alone. So, but I felt that, and I was like, wow, this is totally different. And yeah, we <laughs> have to train up for that. So maybe inshallah, man, we we can try. <laughs> Why not? Why not? <laughs> okay, man, Hazit, uh, Hazit, thank you so much, man. I pray that um, you know, you continue to inspire people and add value to people. And maybe inshallah, one day, you know, we 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 can work something together. And also, it's always for the community, right? Thank yeah. you so much, Hazit. Inshallah, thank you.